And we're on. Thank you, guys. Okay. Here we go. Commissioners, this is a presentation and introductory to chronic wasting disease. Some of this will be uh, a refresher for some of you all, and hopefully some of this will be new information for our new commissioners. So we'll, we'll talk about the basics of chronic wasting disease, talk about the distribution of this disease, reasons why hunters in the agency that don't want it in our state, uh, the greatest risk factors in spreading it, the cumulative risk, and then a little bit about TWRA's response plan. CWD, you may have heard, uh, threatens the health of Tennessee's whitetail deer and elk in the sport of hunting. It is the single greatest threat to these programs. It's estimated that it would have an economic loss of 98 million and a loss of about 1,500 jobs uh, once it occurs in our state. It's it's passed through uh, the environment or by direct contact with bodily fluids of deer or elk. It's not bacterial or viral. Rather, it's caused by the misfolding of a, of a normal protein that then replicates and results in holes in the brain. So it's, all, it's, all, it's always fatal. The uh, infective ag agent is um, commonly referred to as a prion. It's very difficult to destroy. In fact, incineration, which is heating um, in, uh, heating things up to a very, very uh, high temperature, is not even successful sometimes in destroying the prion. So it's very difficult to, to manage and destroy. And it, it w there's even been instances where deer have been in captive uh, locations, and they've, they've gone through extensive efforts to sanitize those areas and uh, take, taking the deer out of those areas for a long period of time, reintroduce the deer into those facilities and they contracted the disease. So it's nearly, nearly impossible to manage. The symptoms are weight loss, excessive eating and drinking, and unusual behavior like lowering, lowering of the head and blank facial expression. I commonly get those with those questions you guys ask me, so you know you're familiar with those. <laughs> Uh, unfortunately, there's uh, no, no treatment or vaccine known to exist. Uh, prevention is the only cure. And unfortunately, states uh, cannot, cannot go back to CWD free uh, once it's discovered because it'll, it'll persist, persist in the environment. Now, the, the distribution of this disease is found in 25 states and two provinces. And, and thank the Lord it's not in Tennessee as far as we know. If you look at this graph, you'll see the areas that are in gray and this is the light gray and the dark gray areas. Those are, the, those are areas where it is known to exist in the wild. And the circles there, the yellow and red, they represent captive facilities, the locations um, where those animals are being raised in captivity, where they've been found to know, or, or the disease has been found there in those animals. And the spread of this disease is, is, has been directly linked to the movement of captive deer and elk. And there's also huge concerns about uh, hunter-killed hunter carcasses. Some, some reasons why you don't want it in your hunting area from a hunter's perspective is, is it necessitates a deer population reduction and the ma mature age classes of deer are discouraged. Now, if, you're, if, you're, if your interest is in, in, in hunting mature bucks, this should be bad news. Um, because that, that would actually having those uh, individual animals in the population would be a, would be problematic because they're most likely to be a carrier of the disease. And if you're a landowner and you one of your primary interest is your hunting interest, uh, it would probably become rather alarming if you realize that uh, the the new emphasis of management in your local area is to drive the population down to a a, a much lesser level. Another consequence is, is that there would be new rules for how you handle venison. So there would be restrictions on how carcass could, could be um, transported and cared for. Uh, loss of base, basic hunting, hunting privileges. This would require the commission, if, if this were to occur in Tennessee, to consider not allowing the use of minerals and maybe not even allowing the use of feed uh, for trail camera surveys and those sort of things. So very significant for the hunters. There's concerns over consuming the meat. Uh, you can only imagine how that uh, might feel, or uh, that would be quite an experience. But 
uh, there's the, and there, the fact there's no cure. And then as, as an aside, taxidermists and processors have a lot to lose as well in regards to CWD. A reason why um, you don't want it from an, from an agency's perspective is, is that no state has won the CWD battle. Again, you can't go back to CWD free. And it inevitably creates conflict with hunters. And uh, it's a no-win situation when you're having to liberali liberalize hunting regulations to drive deer populations down, and then at the same time restrict hunters' privileges to slow the, the spread of the disease. And then agency funds and personnel are, are having to be diverted uh, for the long haul uh, from other important programs. And this is pictures from my friends in Arkansas that have been through this experience. And uh, this, is, this is a common thing there now. You see uh, there on the left, that is their staff at a, at a facility that they've created uh, where, where uh, deer can be brought there to be properly disposed of and sampled. And uh, that's the kind of thing we're talking about that we currently don't have to deal with. And then the, the boxes there are meat that they are storing from animals that they have sampled, and they're holding that meat until they get a negative sample, and then they will release that meat. Uh, and I think that uh, the target there is uh, food pantries eventually, but uh, you could imagine that, that that would be a challenge. Um, and then lastly, the incinerators you see there, that's what I was talking about where you raise the carcass up to a certain temperature for a certain amount of time in hopes of destroying the prions. And, and those, those items there are about 50,000 apiece just to own them, uh, let alone to run them. So, that's the kind of things that would be in our future, unfortunately, if this were to be found in Tennessee. Captive deer and elk are the greatest threat factor in spreading CWD. Thankfully, uh, we don't have, um, or it's not allowed in Tennessee to legally possess live whitetails. And uh, in my professional opinion, I, I think that if we were, we would already have CWD. We would already know it exists here. Uh, fortunately, that's not the case. And fortunately, there's not there doesn't seem to be momentum to allow that in our state, but that is certainly problematic because of the movement of those animals uh, for, for whatever reasons. In Tennessee, we have several of these facilities across the state. You see that there's various colors there, but the, the message is the same. Those are captive facilities in our state, and uh, they just vary depending on the types of animals that they have or maybe their intended purpose. Uh, so they're out there, and uh, we, we need to not forget that. With that, with that practice of, of captive uh, cervid production, uh, there are various authorities in play, and I think this is probably one of the most significant things uh, I hope you'll take away from this, is that obviously TWRA has authority over white-tailed deer, including those that are incidentally uh, contained within a high-fence property, and ownership of these deer are still with the state. Now, the Tennessee Department of Agriculture regulates live importation and live possession of captive deer and elk. And if there's a positive CWD in a captive facility, then the Department of Agriculture will take the lead in that response, and then we would support their efforts. There's also a USDA component here, a couple actually. Uh, the USDA Wildlife, or I'm sorry, USDA Veterinary Services is responsible for developing herd plans. Uh, for positive captive cervid facilities. So if there's a positive in a captive facility, the Department of Ag will take the lead, but they're going to look to the uh, department, the U.S. Department of Agriculture for a herd plan that outlines uh, how animals can be moved in or out of that facility, how, uh, whether they're euthanized, how they're disposed of, uh, and things of that matter. And then also indemnity if there's going to be eventual payment for uh, those animals if they're destroyed. And another component is USDA uh, develops guidelines for state's herd certification programs. Now, if you have a captive cervid facility in Tennessee, uh, you're going to be regulated by the Department of Agriculture if you're involved in interstate uh, movement of animals. So if you're sending animals out of state or sending them in or receiving them in Tennessee, you're required to participate in a herd certification program and those uh, guidelines that the Department of Ag adopts are uh, per USDA. So that's your authority. So there's a lot in play here that you've got to be uh, mindful of. Some other risk factors besides cavid, uh, captive cervids, I like to call these cumulative risks. I learned this from my friends in Arkansas that 
man, there's, there's lots of risk for CWD coming here, and a lot of people seem to minimize some of them. I like the use of uh, deer urine, and it, it may not see it seem as significant as captive service, but when you add up all these small risks, and they're not small risks, but people tend to view them that way, when you add those up, they become cumulative risk, which is very significant. And these would include carcass importation as well. Now, on to uh, the, the CWD response plan. The first component of that is preventative measures. This is a map showing where CWD is located in regards to Tennessee. So we've got three border states there with positives. And because of that, we have a rule that um, restricts how hunter kill carcasses can be brought into our state from those positive areas. And beginning May 1, that those restrictions will apply to all CWD states. The other component of our uh, response plan is early detection. Obviously, that should be a priority for us, and it is. So we do annual sampling, and I just want to point out there's no live test for um, no live test approved by USDA. So therefore, um, all the testing that we do are on uh, deceased or harvested animals. So uh, that's, that's why, that's the type of sampling that we do there. Uh, we're looking for lymph nodes as in the photograph. Moving on, if the disease is, contact, is detected in Tennessee, uh, especially in the wild, we'll, there'll be a ton of work done by us to, uh, to determine just how prevalent it is and then the, the distribution. And it, again, if it's, uh, if it's in a captive service facility and the Department of Ag takes the lead, then we'll be, we'll be looking to them for, or looking to them for how we can help them uh, deal with that issue, and then we'll obviously be interested in the, the, the area around it where there might be wild, wild uh, deer or elk. So a priority on uh, determining prevalence and distribution and then containment. And then there'll have to be there'll be much effort that that'll need to go into educating our hunters as to how to deal with this uh, from their perspective, and then there'll there'll need to be quite a bit of research to determine how well we're doing it containing it, and then what impact is it actually having on our uh, deer or elk herd. So that's it uh, in a, in a nutshell, and uh, I just want to remind you in closing just how blessed we are uh, to have a bountiful uh, deer herd and uh, there's a lot at stake here and I know you guys realize that so I just encourage the commission and their decision making and the agency as well to to uh, to take this very seriously and let's be careful not to take for granted our, our wonderful deer population and elk. Thank you Chuck and I don't want to go on too long but just for the new commissioners I think it's important to know one study to me that really tells you what the problem is that University of Florida in 2015 I think it was took soil that a, a deer with CWD had died on that soil. They completely cleaned all the plant material and everything from the soil in the lab planted grass in that soil then they fed that grass to to some animals I don't know rabbits whatever it was and those animals then reproduced the the prion so you can't get rid of it. Once it's here, you cannot get rid of it. Other animals will be spreading it. And the thing is, too, what, what, it's not only, you know, like, think like radiation. Nobody wants nuclear material in their backyard. But at least radiation will dis dissipate, the half-life will go down, it's eventually going to go away. This does nothing but the opposite. Every animal that, that, that you know, feeds off the carcass or the, the grass the carcass died on, it's going to continue to spread the prion. It's going to do nothing but, but you know, it will just take over, just to, as it did in Wisconsin. Is it? I think it's 50, about 50 percent of the bucks in Wisconsin are CWD positive, if I, if I remember correctly. Well, another way of saying that is in the the area that's infected the worst, it's becoming harder to kill a deer that's negative. Yeah, <coughs> yeah, maybe more than 50 percent than positive. Um, the, the other thing, you know, someday, unfortunately, as hopefully it's many, many decades or centuries, whatever. There's no reason to think that just by natural migration, deer are going to come into our state. But hopefully, CWD positive deer will come into the state. But the worst thing, in my opinion, we can do is drive hundreds of miles to CWD positive areas, bring a carcass back into our state in a pickup truck, drop it in your community, wherever it is, and we're going to end up seeding all these communities with CWD, and we're just helping it. You know, if we had a disease, I think, look at it the other way, if we had a disease that would that would eradicate hogs, 
we wouldn't just let it wander into the state. We would be planting this disease everywhere we could plant it and let it kill the hogs. So why are we going to help CWD kill our deer by bringing it and planting it in all the areas? So that's, that's my Quick question. I'm sorry. How, how long has this stuff been around? Or has it been around for a long time and we're just now discovering it? I well, mean, what, you, what caused it? What started it? Back in the late 60s, it was first discovered in a captive cervid facility in uh, Colorado. So that's, that's when it was discovered. Now, it took, it, it, it took some time, uh, I want to say 80s, before it was found in a wild population uh, in that same state. So it's been around a while, but um, it's, uh, it's knocking at the door now. There's, there's a human form, it's, mad, it's the same as mad cow disease. Uh, there's, there's about, what, six or eight different species that have a, a, this neurologic problem. But, but the good news, though, is that it's only specific to, those, to that species. So, you know, chances are we're not going to get this same process from eating deer, but you don't know. Yeah, and forgive me for not clarifying that. When I when I say deer, I mean deer in general, not just white tails. Any other comments or questions from the committee? Yeah, I've, I've got one, Mr. Chairman. Uh, and this may be just the way you said it, but you said there's no live test that USDA had approved. Does that mean there's no test or there's no test that they would approve and there actually is a test? Well, there there is there are trials occurring with the live test. Uh, it's just USDA doesn't doesn't have confidence enough in those now to uh, approve those as a test because when, whenever whenever we do sampling, um, there's going to be a there's going to be an intermed I can't, I can't say the word there's going to be a, a lab that we send it to, and then the, if if they get a positive, they're then going to send it to a USDA lab for confirmation. Okay, so USDA is in the loop, so we're. You know, obviously, we need to stick to their standards on sampling. But no, there's currently not um, a live test approved. However, uh, in Texas, I know there's there's active in experiments uh, of live test. And the um, one of the ways in Tennessee that concerns me is, and that we're not able to uh, do anything about it at this point. But the elk captive elk herds, and there's several in Tennessee, are managed by the Department of Agriculture in that I was turkey hunting last year and drove by one of these captive elk herd facilities and it did not look like it was double fenced or high fenced at all so I wonder how closely they're really watching them and, it, <laughs> and, and I didn't know they could import and export interstate with elk is that I mean, can they do that now Yes, they can. They're required to uh, be a part of the herd certification program uh, to do the interstate movement. But yeah, they they, they absolutely can be owned. Uh, they can be uh, fenced on you know held in a fence on private property. There's there's nothing that restricts that. And and you know really the the Department of Ag's obligation begins when they start going interstate movement. So it's. Um, if, if you just if you just want to buy some elk from your neighbor and have them, then there's no regulation to prevent that or or no permitting required. And the fellow that you buy them from might have imported some elk from somewhere else that might have CWD. May and might. That's speculative. <laughs> I'm afraid to respond. Not sure. Depends Everyone on the circumstances. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and obviously this is a very significant in terms of the resource aspect of it. My questions are going to be a little more micro, but related to cost, so I don't want to minimize the really big picture of, of this period. Um, just a question, you had the, the slide up that had the storage bin and mentioned that in states that are doing this, they're holding the meat, then it gets tested, and then what's the storage time to test, and when they get those back, do you know what other states have in terms of infrastructure and cost for that piece of regulation. So kind of time on 
from the testing of the meat to when a hunter gets their meat back and then the costs related to all of that process? I, I don't have those details prepared today. We can, I can follow up with you on that. I, I, I think that um, in general, it'll take longer than we want it to uh, mm -hmm. to get the results back. Uh, that, that, that'll take some time, which will require us uh, holding that meat longer. But as far as the, it, to, to give you some idea of cost, I, I know when Arkansas, when, when they were in basically in their first six months of it, they had a thousand, a, a million dollars uh, that, you know, they weren't expecting to spend that year that had to go within those first six months towards their efforts, their response. So very, very significant cost that's going to continue for quite some time. Would, would you, as a follow-up to this, and there's, I don't have a, a tight timeline for it, but could we understand what those costs are and have it some broken out on where it would be? Because I would think you're going to have to have an infrastructure in a state that's shaped like Tennessee, significant infrastructure changes to have refrigerated facilities that are actually going to hold these. There's going to be a cost, I'm guessing, to the agency, to the hunter, perhaps to the folks who hold this meat. I mean, there's a whole lot there, plus testing and I don't know if it's the states that are having to deal with it, getting a survey of what all the costs are that they've borne and where those costs go. But it would be very interesting to understand that um, if that's something that you wouldn't mind to look into. Yeah, in fact, we've, we've, we're already learning those details and actively having those conversations. So it, it shouldn't, shouldn't take long for us to have more information. Director Carter, do you have a comment? The Southeast directors just met Friday and Saturday, uh, and part of that is is the discussion by several different organizations. And one of those was was the Southeast Wildlife Co Southeast Disease Wildlife Cooperative folks out of Georgia who do most of our testing for whatever we have in, in most of the southeastern states. There are other labs as well, but Dr. Fisher, who heads that up, had the opportunity to spend this one-on-one -on -one time with him, asking him several of those questions that we were discussing here. He made two or three points that I think might be relevant. One was that as far as a live test, and uh, Chuck has alluded that they're looking at live testing in several states in Texas. To summarize what he said is that so far those have not worked. He said we, we've tried it, we get some good indications, but that, that's not really happening. As far as testing, uh, I don't know, and in talking with him, I don't know of any way an on-site test. You take the materials you need from the deer, you send it off to a lab, and you have X amount of time, depending on the workload of that particular lab, as to how long it takes to get that back. The other thing to keep in mind is that you do not get a negative result on a CWD. You only get positive results. So if it comes back, you can't say, well, it was negative. It, you just didn't get a positive. And he wanted to really emphasize that point as well. But they, there was a lot of discussion about urine and deer urine as it crosses borders because it can carry the disease in the urine. And there is no mandatory thing right now that allows somebody to say that we're disease-free urine. There, there are parameters that they put around that to say that this, this urine, if they want to comply, there's not a mandatory compliance either, but if somebody wants to put that out as saying, hey, my product it came from a disease-free, all they can say is that that herd was disease-free for X number of years. Dr. Fisher pointed out that that may be as good as whatever day it was tested on, that the, the next day it could have that present. So he, he hasn't got a lot of, uh, I think, faith in that as well. My last question to him was that there are talk of allowing you know facilities to bring the CWD, known CWD areas into Tennessee and look at those. I said, what's your comments on that? And he said, about all I can tell you is that I would keep it as simple as I can looking at other states and knowing that they've had lots of loopholes created. But he said, my, my, again, I'm really summarizing, but essentially he said, you're better off to keep it out, have, the, have them cleaned and things before they come in as, instead of allowing dis known diseased deer to come in and then try to get rid of it. So I just thought I'd pass that on to you. That's great information. Thank you very much. And one other thing along that line, too, is that the incubation period is about a year, and it takes about a year and a half before the, the deer dies. And so you very, I'm sure many people have harvested a deer, bring it in, they think it looks like a healthy deer, but it's infected. And so the prions are now wherever they dump that carcass. So any other comments? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I had, you oh. know, um, almost made me forget what I was going to ask. Oh, I guess if you had 
with all the the changes that we did last year in, the, in, in Virginia and Arkansas and all the 150 mile radius and all, are we completely banned all importation from every CWD state at this point or every state? Where, where are we and is there something else we need to do that, that yeah, we okay. haven't done? Okay, so in, let me clarify one thing. I'll take the blame for this, but the word ban, ban is dangerous because uh, it gives the perception that we're not allowing these hunter killed carcasses to be brought into our state, and that's not true. We just, we're just restricting how they're brought in from positive areas. So where we are today is, is that if a, in every state that has CWD except Virginia, that you're required to uh, have it deboned, et cetera, before you bring it in, a deer or elk from positive states, uh, and there's an exception with Virginia. However, come a first, uh, we go live with requiring even Virginia hunters to meet those restrictions. So May 1st, we begin all positive states deer or elk being brought in by hunters from those positive states are required to meet those restrictions. Commissioner Woods. Uh, I've been asked several years, you know, a lot of the surrounding states <coughs> bait for deer, allow baiting. Uh, is there any direct links from baiting to CWD? It's, it, it's even broader than that, just feeding in general, um, supplemental feeding, I'll call it, where you're concentrating infected animals is going to increase the infection rate of that local population. I, I don't, don't take this as, um, don't take offense to this, but it's really just as simple as kids in a school. You know, if you've got, if you concentrate them in that school and several of them are sick, then the, they're going to, the infection rate's going to increase. And it's, it's really that simple with supplemental feeding. And it's not just specific to uh, CWD, but, but other diseases as well. Commissioner Swan. Um, because of the long inc incubation period, um, we don't know if deer being brought in from non-CWD states are um, positive because there's no way to, um, there's no way to tell uh, because of the long incubation period. That being the case, to really keep Tennessee safe, wouldn't it be best just to prohibit the importation of any carcass from outside the state of Tennessee? My mindset's a little, uh, narrower than that I, I know that we have we have a rule that tells us tells the Commission how um, how areas are designated and they've got to be a positive area before they can be added to the list by the Commission uh, so what you're considering or pr proposing there would require a rule change which is um, I'm not I'm not sure that's the desire of the Commission or not but I just I, really, that's, all, that's the only feedback I have is that what you're talking about uh, requires more action than we've taken in the past on, on this specific uh, question. Uh, I was asking a question rather than proposing it. The other question I've got is uh, because there's no uh, test for um, the live animals, the um, urine-based products that are used for attractants come from captive um, cervids. Um, should we not consider uh, banning the use of that? I think considering any anything that, that could help keep it out of the state is a good idea. And that, again, um, what you're what you're um, mentioning uh, there Asking. is a uh, is um, would also require a rule change and uh, additional action by the commission. Bill, I'll. I'll make the statement for me that I think we need to do what you were asking about. I think we need to close down all importation because you don't know when it's positive or not. And so that is the absolute safest thing to do, in my opinion. 
And I believe um, I'd I like to talk to Dr. Fisher. It'd be great to, to, to ask that directly. Or maybe you did. Did you ask him that directly? Um, I mean, I, I agree with you totally. The thing of it is, is the longer we can prevent it from coming here, the better science is going to be to deal with it if it ever does happen in the state. Commissioner Holbert. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Joe, the one thing I'd like to bring out is last year you guys sent out some things to taxidermists uh, showing, you know, a chart of where they could be and where. I think we need to do, regardless of what this commission decides to do, we need to do a better job of educating our hunters and educating what's going to happen if this does come here. Because right now, I do not think they understand. Um, you guys got the taxidermist attention last year? There's no doubt. I had them come to me and say, hey, we, we were taking those deer. We really didn't realize it was that big of a deal. But that's our business. That's our livelihood. That's what we depend on. Um, and if, if this disease comes, then we're going to lose that. So uh, this, this is people that were, were against what we did last year. We're against closing those states. But now, since they've been educated, have come around and are on our side. And I think that's very important, whether it's email blasts, whether it's uh, posters at license sales, whatever you need to do, I would like to ask that you do it. Um, it's very important, regardless if we take any action or not, um, to educate the deer hunters of this state. Commissioner Stroud. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Is there any federal money, is there any funds, or is there any funding about uh, educating the people about this stuff? Uh, I guess you, we're talking about the USDA. Do they, uh, is there a campaign, or is there any uh, way of, uh, from the federal government, or is it, are they helping to uh, uh, make the awareness of, the, of this stuff uh, happen? I mean, is, uh, is there anything like that at all? Or is it just up to us, uh, being a, the states? Does, this, does the federal government do anything about that? Is that a relevant question? I'm not aware of any federal outreach programs on CWD, at least if there is one, it's probably targeted at positive states. Um, I'm looking around at some of my colleagues and nobody's shaking their head yes, so I don't think there is such an effort. Now, the only um, you know, there's a strong federal component here with the captive servants, and and then there's there there was a there was a program once upon a time where they helped fund CWD sampling for uh, they helped the agency fund CWD sampling, but that program's been discontinued. Yeah. And to mm -hmm. Commissioner Holbert's point, the last thing I'll say about it is that you know we're we're used to dealing with viruses and and bacteria and fungus, we all know about that, but this is not that. It's totally different, and, and um, you can't look at it the same way. I've got Director one, Carter. Uh, to follow up to what you all were talking about, and, and I don't disagree with you particularly, but when we were considering this several months ago or last year, we were concerned about what other states were doing and what other states had done, and we didn't know that Mississippi had already the banned carcass importation, et cetera. So if we're going to consider doing something further, it would be helpful before the concern is raised to know what other states have done. Yeah, well, we've got that information. We can, we can share that with you. Okay. Director Carter. I was just going to mention to, in terms of informational campaigns, both the southeastern region and the National Association both have wildlife disease committees. And both the CWD is a high priority in both of those. They are putting together lots of, of information. There, there's not a nationwide campaign. Uh, it gets a little, little gray area when you, when you get into whether or not you can utilize federal funding for those kind of campaigns. But in any case, there, there is that information available. Thank you. Any other comments from the commission? Commissioner Garner. Thank you, Chairman. Um, you said there's no cure for it, and I, I get that. But uh, because it's a prion, and I don't under, pretend to understand all, all of it, I'm still learning. But uh, is there a, a concerted effort nationwide or at a federal level or, or even local states that are, I mean, states that are doing uh, research that's trying to find a way to combat this and get on the offensive instead of just a reactive, uh, you know, how do we keep it out? Um, are we trying to? eliminated or is anybody doing anything on that end well I I guess the best example of that is um, 
the Tennessee Wildlife Federation's efforts uh, led by Mr. Butler. Uh, they had a CWD sum summit a couple of months ago and it began a campaign that now that I think of it would meet the criteria of what you were describing but it wouldn't be a federal program. But a lot of emphasis on uh, communications, uh, education, and, uh, and research. So I, I'd say that there's a, a pretty impressive movement uh, that is that is started through through that effort, and it is in fact a will be a nationwide effort. I can add a little bit to that. I spoke to the microbiologist in Boston that developed the the, the test to detect mad cow disease, which is the same <clears throat> same disease, the same pre well, it's a prion, same process in in cattle. And you know they would, the cattle industry would love to have that vaccine, and they, you know, it's not there. There's, it's, it's not even again, it's not like a virus that even would lend itself to a vaccine. And so they're, they're working, but it's, there's no, there's nothing on the horizon. It's just a, it's, it's an abnormally folded protein, and so, and then when the protein tries to reproduce, it produces a, a different. A, a different structure it's in a it's in a different pattern than it should be and and then it, it just affects their, their neuro, neurologic system it's a neurologic disease it affects their brain spinal cord that sort of thing no it's not no it's that's the weird part about it it's a piece of protein that just the the way the 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 structure of it is it makes it have a kink in it and that kink creates the disease that affects affects them so that's why it's not like a virus a virus you could create a vaccine but there's no one there's nothing you can do to to make that protein not be in their system mm -hmm. uh, uh, the the one thing that uh, we're kind of losing sight of though is a hunter can bring that deer back as long as he capes the uh, head out and uh, gets rid of the skull and the um, the bone uh, he can bring the meat and the uh, cape back in the uh, skull plate as long as it's cleaned out and removed from the uh, carcass. 